Hello, students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker with another lecture today talking about two-dimensional general curvilinear motion, talking about general motion as in it's not specific to any one coordinate system. And then we'll get into the three different coordinate systems we'll use here in Dynamics. But to start out with, let's take a look at a particle moving along a path. Okay, so let's say that we have a curved path, hence this idea of curvilinear motion. And given this curved path, let's say that our particle moves from position one over to position two. Now, as we develop this derivation, we're gonna assume that these are infinitesimally close together, but for now, we can just think about them being some distance apart. Okay, and so we could use a reference point, call this our origin point, point O, to draw some position vectors. So here would be what I could call R vector. Now notice here in two-dimensional positions, we're going to use a position vector R versus a distance S. Okay, this is a small transition from 1D to 2D. We can also use this same origin point to draw another position vector. I'm going to call this R prime. Okay, because the curve isn't necessarily centered around point O. And then between these two points, one and two, we could draw a third position vector and call this delta R. So as we take a look at this relationship, between R and V. Now that we're looking at two dimensional vectors, let me just go ahead and make a quick statement that all 2D vectors, this is really true of other vectors as well, but we'll mainly focus on 2D ones here in dynamics. All 2D vectors are made of, so they're made of, or they consist of, two things. The first thing is the magnitude. And along with the magnitude comes the units, right? So this would be like 100 newtons, the magnitude and the units. And then the second thing that a vector consists of is the direction. Both of these things can change with time. Okay, that's a very important kind of a key mental thing to think about is that vectors are made up of two different elements, magnitude and units, and then also direction. And that both can change with time. They don't both have to change with time, but they both can change with time. Okay, so as we write a vector relationship between these position vectors, we can write that R, plus delta r, right? We're basically starting here at point O, going through point one, adding on delta r. We get to the exact same place as if we'd taken r vector prime all by itself, okay? So this is, does not mean that the length of our original vector r plus the length of delta r is equal to the length of r prime, right? That would be true if it was a one-dimensional problem, but this is the vectors, basically a vector addition uh, relationship. Another thing we can define related to these um, position vectors and our velocity now is that we can term, determine a term called the average velocity, okay? So V average is equal to delta R our displacement of that particle divided by some change in time. Okay, so we're assuming, of course, it can take some kind of time for that particle to go from one to two. It turns out that we don't use average velocity very often in dynamics. We tend to use instantaneous velocity. So our instantaneous velocity which we'll use just the vector label V. So V vector is equal to, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a limit of this average velocity to find instantaneous. So in calculus terms here, the limit 
as delta t approaches zero of this fraction delta r vector divided by delta t is equal to dr dt. Now using our dot notation, we could also call this r vector dot. Okay, so not just the time rate of change of the magnitude of the position vector, but also the time rate of change of the direction. Both of those things are lumped into our, our velocity vector. Now we could have the same fundamental relationship for the instantaneous acceleration. So let's put a quote right here, so I have to rewrite instantaneous, instantaneous acceleration. And instantaneous acceleration tells us that, let me move this down just a touch, that our A acceleration vector, it is, it is going to equal the same structure. It's actually going to be the time limit of the velocity. So the limit as delta T approaches zero of delta V vector divided by delta delta t, and this is going to equal d v vector d t, or we could also write this as our v vector dot. Okay, so the time rate of change of the velocity is the acceleration. If you wanted to see a diagram, which essentially looks a lot like our position vector diagram that also then relates the velocity to the acceleration, you can take a look in the Hibbler textbook on page 33, that's of the 13th edition, and in section 12.4, it shows what's called a hodograph, and it shows how you can relate actually these velocities. The velocities would look like this. Here's the velocity at one. So we'll call this V1 vector and the velocity here at two, V2 vector. Now one very convenient thing about these velocity vectors is that velocity vectors are always tangential to the path. 100% of the time they are tangential to the path. So our V1 was tangential here to 0.1 and V2 was tangential to 0.2. Just a little side note here. I'll put always tangential to the path. So you always know what direction velocity is in if you know what your path looks like. Acceleration is a little bit more complicated and we'll talk about that more moving forward. So now that we have the general relationships developed, it turns out that the next few sections, the next few videos, are gonna focus on the various coordinate systems. Okay, so the coordinate systems that we use in dynamics, there's three different ones. One of those is going to be the Cartesian or the X, Y coordinate system. We also have the tangent normal coordinate system, T comma N. And then finally, the R theta, which fundamentally is like the two dimensional portion of the spherical coordinate system. It also works out that it's also the two-dimensional version of the cylindrical coordinate system. So this is either spherical or cylindrical. So you might be wondering which coordinate system that you should choose uh, given a certain kind of problem. And we'll spend a fair bit of time kind of talking about this in some of the videos and have probably have some interactives on it and whatever else. But fundamentally, you want to pick a coordinate system which matches the acceleration.
So the reason that you want to match the acceleration of a problem is that the acceleration fundamentally governs how the motion is, is happening, right? So one of the simplest types of acceleration we'll deal with in this class actually falls into Cartesian coordinates, and that's going to be gravitational acceleration, okay? 100% of gravitational acceleration is going to be in the negative y direction, right, going down toward the center of the Earth. And so that's going to dictate if you have a problem that is under the influence of gravity and gravity alone, you're going to go ahead and use a Cartesian coordinate system. It turns out for the other two coordinate systems, tangent normal, you end up using the tangent normal if your acceleration is happening along your path. Okay, it's actually described as some kind of, kind of acceleration along a curved path. And then the third type, spherical or cylindrical, is if you have information about um, a location, and it's usually a non-moving location, and then an arm, which is basically moving your particle around that fixed location. And we'll get into that one in more detail. But bottom line, pick a coordinate system which matches the acceleration. So let's first take a look at the Cartesian coordinate system. So once again, we're going to have a path, and our path will look something like this. And so this is our path. And so our particle is located on this path, moving along it. And so if we draw onto here our velocity, once again, velocity is always tangential to that path, that we could break this into two components, one of those being a vertical component, call that V sub Y, and the other one being a horizontal component here, call that V sub X. Okay, so essentially just taking our velocity, breaking into x and y components. Additionally, we could draw a position vector on this diagram, call this r, and using the origin as the origin point, call this r sub x, and vertically here, r sub y. So just an equation form over on the side, we can just note that our r vector is equal to, using bracket notation, rx comma ry. And we can do the same thing for our velocity vector, that our v vector is equal to vx, vy, and that our acceleration vector, which one thing that's kind of interesting and you get to know a lot better in this class, is that accelerations of anything in a curved path have to be going something toward the middle of the curve. Okay, and we'll get into the nuances a little bit more as we get into tangent normal. But let's just call this our acceleration vector. It has to be going toward the center of curvature. It's two components, ax and ay. And so we can write here that our acceleration vector is equal to the components, ax, and a y. And of course, any of these, if you were given the components by themselves, wanted to find the magnitude, you could apply the Pythagorean theorem, right? The square root of the sum of the squares to end up with the magnitude of that overall vector. But like I said, the key um, element in this, why you would choose an x, y problem, is that you had well-defined accelerations in the x and the y direction. Hopefully this helps kind of map out these fundamental relationships between the vectors r, v, and a, the position, the velocity, and the acceleration, and also provides a quick overview of Cartesian curvilinear motion.